So we're super excited to talk to you guys today about what, how we work together between design, product management, and design research to validate ideas through design thinking. Um, so to start off, I'll introduce a little bit more about myself. So my name is Christine Yoon, and I am the design manager on the Pages team. So all three of us work on Pages. For those of you guys that don't know what Pages is, it's if you looked at LinkedIn and you looked up a school or a company, um, basically it's like the profile for a company at that point or, or the organization. Um, I've been at LinkedIn for a little less than three years. And before that, my background, I actually studied business in my undergrad. Um, and I worked at Deloitte Consulting for five years. And I almost became a product manager. <laughs> so a um, fun fact is like, actually, like when I was on the cusp of thinking about a career change, I was applying to product management jobs and design school at the same time. And um, I ultimately decided to go to design school. I went to the California College of the Arts here in San Francisco and got my master's of interaction design. And since then, I've been working at LinkedIn um, for the last three years and have worked my way up through management. So that's more about me. And I'll hand it off to Ariel. So cool. My name is Ariel Sianfon, and as Christine said, I work on the Pages team. I'm the senior researcher uh, on Pages, and I, I'm like, what should I say about my? <laughs> Really um, yeah, cool I mean, who <laughs> studies like tech in college? I don't know. I studied international relations, and I, I actually like went and did internships like at the UN and in Congress, and I was like, man, this is a really brutal place to start your career. And so when I came out of school, I got a job at a startup that was kind of like democratizing data, and I was so in love with it. I thought it was really cool. Um, but working in a startup, there are lots of issues, and one of them can be not paying enough attention to your users. Um, and so I really got passionate about users and understanding them and figuring out how to bring that voice more into the equation, especially when you have very, very passionate founders. Um, I think it can be a really, really important role. Um, so that's kind of how I got into this field. And along my path, I also actually started a podcast about user experience research called Mixed Methods and a Slack group. So now I lead a group that has about 9,000 uh, UX researchers and design researchers. Um, yes, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Hey guys, I'm Julia. I'm a product manager at LinkedIn. I uh, have the opportunity to both work with Ariel and Christine on the Pages product. Uh, so a bit about my background. I went to Northwestern University. I'm while there studying math and statistics. And really the rationale of graduating was how can I use data to drive decisions in the workplace? Uh, so like data, decisions, that sounds like strategy. So I started there, uh, started my time working in BizOps. So BizOps is kind of like internal consulting group or strategy group. So I spent two years there. Um, and then after two years, realized we had a lot of great ideas, but there was kind of this black box operation of well, how does this idea reach a user and what happens from uh, that step is what was really exciting to me. So pivoted into product management. I've been doing that now for a year at LinkedIn um, and have absolutely loved it. So excited to share a little bit more about what we do with you guys. Should we, uh, I'm curious, how many of you are actually like product managers right now? Okay, cool. How many of you work in tech? How many of you work in design or research? Oh, nice. And then engineering? Okay, there we go. Let's work on that. Oh, nice. Oh. Yeah, there we go. That's our agenda. So we're going to start touching a little bit on the LinkedIn process. To how do we do things at LinkedIn? From how do we build products? How do we do design? And what is how, where does research play in that? then diving really into our research methods and Ariel will come take us through that and ending with a fireside chat and after that we'll have some open Q&A uh, so save questions for the end. Yep, there we go. So product development at LinkedIn. So when we think about products, this is how our philosophy is. And so first we define a problem. So you can think about many different ways to define a problem. So a problem could come directly from your users, so support volume, angry tweets, um, and anything in between those, it could come from data. So we're seeing gaps in our usage, we're seeing uh, metrics drops, or it could be our strategy as a company, our mission statement, and then defining a problem from there. So from any one of those three sources could be really our starting point. From there, we'll do research, and that's really what we're gonna spend most of today talking about. So we'll do several different types of research to help kind of conceptualize what is that problem and what why are we uniquely set to solve it. So at LinkedIn, it would be why is LinkedIn positioned to solve this problem, and specifically, why might the Pages team be set to solve this problem. From there, a PM will sit down with their design and edge counterparts and think through what might a minimum viable product look like. 
So we've got this lofty idea, we've got a problem, we've got some research to back why users might want it. What is the core minimum feature set that we might need to launch with to understand what is the market thing? What do users think? How are they engaging with it? And then from there, as you see, these lines go in a few different directions. We might continue exactly down that same path and follow that product vision, follow that strategy that might be two, five years out. Or we might go up, down, left, center of any other pivots that we really do from that MVP. Uh, and so we want to think about how can we launch something and then learn. So that sounds exciting. And I would be lying if I said we did this, just the three of us. So we wanted to talk through who really does this and who plays a part. But by no means is every single one of these people or teams a part of every product launch. If that was true, we'd be sitting here for years <laughs> defining a problem and doing the research before we ever thought of an MVP. So I'll walk through a little bit of what these teams look like at LinkedIn as I realize different companies and different organizations, they play out differently. So product management, hopefully we're a little familiar to product is at LinkedIn is the problem space owner. And the, the idea of that is, is you are defining a problem for a core set of users and from there working with all of these other teams to validate what that might look like. Then UX design, so that's really thinking through what are the flows what might a user need to see, and how would we take them through this type of experience. So they would lead all of that work. Then we have design research. So this is really talking to users and understanding what are their core needs, what fundamental problems do they have, anything from that through does this button make sense, what were you expecting when you clicked it, um, and there's a whole range of research that Ariel will talk through. And then we have product operations. So these people, I couldn't imagine my day without, so they help us keep a strong pulse on any support tickets, any tweets, any Facebook messages, any direct messages to our uh, exec staff, and what are people saying about your product and how it's functioning for them today. So we'll hear a lot of, this isn't working for me, this is super slow for me, I don't understand, things like that will come from product operations. So those are the four key functions that all roll up to product for us when you think about validating the idea. Then within engineering, we've got data science. And so data science will help us on the quant perspective. So what data do we have that might back an idea and help us validate a flow? So examples of that could be, our goal is to hit a million users by the end of the year. How many do we have today? How many do we have top of funnel that we might be able to then channel down the flow? What are those users doing? Can we meet them where they are? So those type of insights we would use to validate an idea through data with data science. Then within marketing, we have two teams that are pretty pivotal, and so one is product marketing. So product marketing will help us keep a lay of the land in that they go to a lot of events and talk about our product and focus on the go-to-market. So how do we bring our flows and our uh, stories to users at scale? And so they'll help us with like, quarterly release emails, big ads launches, emails to uh, users, and big events. Then we have market research, who also helps with quants. So quant, uh, in their sense, is actual surveys. So they'll send surveys to thousands of people. Um, and what's really interesting, the nuance there, is they're one of the only teams on this slide that is focused not just on LinkedIn, but also focused on what, how are users solving this problem elsewhere. So are they using Yelp? Are they using Facebook? Are they using Twitter? And how does their sentiment on LinkedIn compare to a sentiment on another platform or tool? Um, so that's always really interesting to benchmark ourselves to other partner products. And the last piece that sits within finance is BizOps. And that's actually where I started my career. And BizOps is a team that is our strategy team. So you can think of them and their role in this process of thinking about a large problem. What is the total addressable market? What is the overall market opportunity and how might LinkedIn play within that? Or how might this product play within this overall landscape? The other piece that's super interesting about BizOps is that they'll not only think lofty, but they'll also get into the details of tracking performance. So if you said you want to get a million users, that means you need five ramps that each have X impact, and they'll start to quantify that and track and hold the team to that standard. How um, many other people are totally overwhelmed by this slide? <laughs> I feel like one of the big things, at least for me, like coming from a startup or like a smaller company to LinkedIn was just like the explosion of specialization and like trying to figure out like where my role fit in with like all these other research functions and honestly I would say like it's like just now and I've been at LinkedIn for two years that it's like you're really starting to settle into those relationships and understand like the boundaries between them and that's like one of the things that at least for me like making that transition 
that was most, um, I guess, like unexpected and difficult to just like figure out how to navigate working with a team of this many people plus all of your managers plus like all of the other teams who like have some stake in your product. Whereas like when you're at a startup, it really is just like three or four people in a room like chatting about stuff. Yeah, so now Christine's going to walk us through the software development lifecycle and how we do things at a more granular level at LinkedIn. Awesome. I'm actually going to stand because my deck <laughs> gets a little small, so it'll be easier to reach it. Um, okay, so I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with the software development lifecycle. This is how a lot of tech companies implement software. At LinkedIn, we follow it as well. So the phases that we typically go through are discover, design, develop, and deploy. Um, those teams that you saw on the previous slide, we all work together at some level um, throughout the software development lifecycle. Um, what I'm going to focus on a lot more is how product and design really focus and work together as part of this and research as well. So as part of the software development lifecycle, um, the design process really carries throughout. I know this is kind of small, so I'll kind of cover it. Um, so through the discover phase, this is where when we first come up with an idea as a team, where we're like, okay, we think we have a problem, let's kind of figure out how we want to solve it. So at this stage, um, product is trying to understand, you know, what are our users' needs, um, they're trying to de develop the roadmap and the requirements. Um, on the design side, we're also trying to understand contextually how is the landscape, uh, who are our competitors in this space. We're trying to figure out design principles and trying to get alignment across all of these different cross-functional partners we're working with in terms of where we want to go in terms of the vision. Um, then, after we've kind of finished up the discover phase, we go to the design phase. And within the design phase, um, this is where the designers really take a lot of the ownership. This is where we take the data that we've gathered from that previous phase and start implementing it into designs and making sure that we are actually defining a narrative, making flows that make sense, um, and thinking about all the wireframes and the concepts. Um, and throughout this process, we're constantly getting feedback and testing and iterating. We're either doing usability research or trying to get some other data to validate as well as part of the process. And this goes through a lot of different cycles um, as we're kind of communicating with different stakeholders. And then afterwards, um, we go into the development stage. So this is where it's a lot more heavier on the engineering side. This is when we start doing the implementation process. Um, as in design and product, what we do is at that point, we work together with the engineers to make sure that the build is successful. We also start thinking about how we want to track these metrics. So when we're building in the designs, how we want to build in tracking so that we can measure it later. We're also part of the QA process. We're helping product management and also our operations team as well to get support up and ready and helping people who are going to be using our platform. And then at the final stage is when we actually deploy the product. But our work isn't done there. So once we deploy, we're still trying to measure and we're still trying to understand the success of our designs, the success of the product. Um, we're also trying to address bugs that come in from the support team and whatnot. And we're constantly evaluating and thinking about how we can change the roadmap. Now the thing about the software development life cycle, it looks linear, but it's not. We actually go through a lot of iterative cycles, especially at a product org, um, which might be different from, say, if you're working at a consultancy or an agency, where sometimes you just go to the end and then you hand it off. Um, so where does research fall into this and how we kind of look at like uh, research data in general? It basically carries throughout. So in each of these stages, Ariel is going to go into a lot more detail around what these three things are. We have foundational research, formative research, and evaluative research, and these span throughout the life cycle um, in terms of how we make decisions at LinkedIn. Okay, so I'll hand it off to Ariel to talk about the research methods. Cool. So how many of you have ever done UX research before? Well, cool. any other forms of like design research as well? Um, so really when we talk about UER, that's what we call it at LinkedIn, user experience research, but most companies call it UX research, some people call it design research, there's a lot of different names for what we do. Um, we're talking about three types of research and even here there are different names. So sometimes you'll hear people say generative instead of foundational or something like that. But really as Christine was kind of mentioning early, earlier, these are like different stages of research. So foundational research is what you do when you really are just trying to explore an area or get a grasp on something. So for example, let's say you take over a new product and you're not sure what the needs or the problems or the concerns of your admins are. You might do something that's more foundational and typically that's going to be sitting down and having a conversation as opposed to coming in with some sort of uh, design mock that you want to use 
use as you know a way to start a conversation and get really specific feedback. So then moving on, when you get into formative, this is really when you have some sort of idea, you have a, you know the problem you want to solve, you have an idea about how to solve it, and you're really trying to get more formative research done so that you can refine that idea, right? So that you can decide, is this concept better or is this idea better, right? Which of these is kind of getting me closer to the goal that I have? And then the third type of research is evaluative. So this is really what we're all probably more familiar with. This is usability testing, right? And as you can see, that's like at the end a very small part of research. And I think sometimes it gets a little bit too much weight in terms of like UX, UX research as a field. Um, it can be super valuable, but it's only giving you a small amount of value at the end as opposed to giving you strategic insight at the beginning. So in terms of the methods that we use when it comes to these different types of research, Foundationally, you might be thinking about sitting down a one-on-one -on -one, you know, interview. You might think of something like contextual inquiry. So this is like the sexy, cool research where you're actually like going out into someone's home and talking to them about like how they clean their house or something like that. Um, so those are some of the, the methods. I think one method that is so underrated and really maybe more powerful than any other is just reviewing what's already been done. So especially when you, you know, are at an organization that has a body of work um, that's been built up over years, or even at a startup, as long as you have some research, going back and just checking that out, like you can take so much off your plate as a researcher. Like I probably have two to three projects that I don't have to do this quarter because of all the work that's been done before. Um, and then also looking at what's been done in academic settings. I have a friend who works on Facebook VR, and. You know, they were trying to figure out how people should navigate in a space, right? Like, how far should like your avatar be from my avatar, and like, how should like social proximity and stuff like that work? And you can imagine, like, you could spend a lot of time doing research to try to figure that out. You could do tons of surveys, and surveys are really expensive. Or you could look into what's already been done, and there's actually like a whole body of academic work that's been done around social proximity and like how far people are comfortable sitting from each other and things like that, right? So there's a lot that you can lean on, um, especially when you're going into a, a brand new space that hasn't really been explored before. Um, and then when it comes to formative, this is when you're gonna be doing stuff like concept testing. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with tools like Envision, um, you know, where you can make these prototypes, or even just like a printed out prototype of your design. You can sit down with someone and ask them, you know, uh, questions to understand if this is like in the right, uh, on the right path. Right, so you're still trying to refine and understand and sometimes you'll be showing them two to three concepts and trying to understand which one is the direction you should be heading. You can also do intercept interviews. So this is something a lot of smaller companies will use and this is when you straight up go to Starbucks or somewhere and you sit down. And again, like you need to be really careful with this type of research because you're getting anyone, right? So if your product that you're building is for anyone or it's for people who love coffee, then like by all means go to Starbucks. Um, but if your company is for some other segment, you just need to be really careful about the feedback that you're getting and um, how much weight to give it. Um, and then evaluative, as I already mentioned, this is when you're doing usability testing type stuff. You're really just trying to figure out, like, did you get, like place the button somewhere that people can find it? Like, are the nitty gritty details right? Can people actually accomplish A through Z? Um, so this is, at this point, hopefully you have the problem defined you've already figured out like the path you need to take. This is really just like button placement, color, like things like that that are a little bit smaller as opposed to more foundational questions. Um, and then when it comes to the outputs of these different types of work, um, with foundational, you're really kind of looking for large opportunity areas, right? Like this might be where you discover a totally new area that you didn't realize that your user actually has a big need that your company could be solving, right? This is where you're looking for things that are gonna be more innovative, you're trying to understand journey maps, so really like workflows for someone, things that are a bit more high level. And this is where you're gonna get deep insight into your user. Whereas with formative research, you're gonna be getting UX recommendations, right? So like go with design one as opposed to design three, or you're gonna get design insights, like this user was really confused about the way that you set up you know, this filtering system or something like that. And then evaluative is really where you're gonna get like very nitty gritty UX recommendations, what to fix is, is what we call them, and then pass fails on different tasks. Um, so something else that I wanted to cover is programs. I don't know how many of you are familiar with like programmatic research. Anyone heard of programs? Cool. Um, okay, so programs are something that larger companies 
companies often use and smaller companies, I would say, try to use. Um, and programs basically allow you to scale because one of the problems that every single company I've ever heard of or worked for has is uh, just scaling research, right? So on our team, it's like five to one in terms of designers to researchers. And if you have each of those designers who are working on different projects, you can imagine it can get pretty difficult to scale those resources. Um, and so what programs allow you to do is, you know, take a small number of researchers and grow your impact. So some examples of this are Field Day. So Field Day is a foundational program that we do, and it's actually when the research team will partner up with execs, will go to a market, and we'll take like our CEO, Jeff Wiener, out to a customer's home, and we'll talk to a specific segment of our customers so you can imagine in terms of like cross-organizational impact, that's huge. Because basically every time we do a field day, we come back and Jeff is like, we have to solve this problem for whatever group you just talked to. Because you know when you're sitting there like face to face with someone, it's just so impactful. Um, so that's been a really cool program that we've done. One of the ones that LinkedIn is best known for though is Bentos. Um, so Bentos is basically a program, we call it design-led research supported, where we allow designers to go through a training and then we provide them the support and tools and things like that that they need. So we give them the labs, we give them, uh, you know, we basically help them find the right recruits that they need, we set them up with the incentives, we, we kind of like take care of some of those surrounding things um, and then let them lead the research. So from like our perspective, it, it's a win-win, right? Because they get the program uh, or the research done that they need, but we don't have to do all the work ourselves. Um, and I think also with that program, it's great because you're also building up that uh, knowledge base on your team. And we've had designers who have switched over to research, we've had researchers who have switched over to design, so there's all sorts of stuff happening. Um, and then in terms of evaluative, the one that I actually want to fo focus on is Topless. So there are a lot of different programs that different companies run, like you may have heard of Rapid Research at Google, which is a really cool program that they do, Instagram has a similar one. Um, but Tapas, and so we, we have a program like that, but Tapas I think is kind of cool, and it's basically, we have all of these researchers who have a lot of knowledge about specialized groups. So like for example, if you have a question about what a page admin might say, like I've talked to so many page admins, so I can like play the part of one of those admins for you. And so with Tapas, if we have a team that just needs to get some quick insight, we'll set up basically like a call for them with a number of researchers who are each representing different perspectives and allow them to just kind of ask us questions like in our personas or in like these different, um, I mean, yeah, these different, I guess, identities or whatever. And that one's just a fun one that I think is um, something that's pretty easy to replicate just depending on the expertise that you have on the team. Yeah, and one thing I want to call out too with like research is that it's sometimes a misconception that the researcher is the only one who owns the research process. That is totally not the case at LinkedIn. Um, everyone is involved from product to design and engineering um, as part of the process. And we're constantly giving Arielle inputs um, and helping her. She just might own like, you know, doing the recruiting or helping develop the guide and like doing most of the interviews and kind of shaping up what those insights should be that the team works on. But the whole time we're also contributing and thinking about like how these things are going to help us in our day to day. So the one piece that I would second is so when we have engineers sit on some of these research calls has changed the game in the level of excitement in building a feature. So for one that hasn't been like a super pretty one is like roles and permissions. So roles and permissions, really tough problem to craft, really difficult from the design side, from the engineering side. Um, and so we went up to our engineer team, we're like, hey guys, we're gonna build roles and permissions. Like, Do you know how long it's gonna take? He's like, let's talk about it. Uh, but then when we went through like some case volumes and prior research of when you see thousands of people submitting cases about this every day, reading these verbatims, listening to admins talk about it, it completely changed the perspective of like, what are we doing? Do we start today? Um, and so I think that that's a super valuable skill of making research inclusive, whether it's spinning in the calls, whether it's sharing out docs and do researchers doing really, really inclusive share outs, or even just sharing notes and making them accessible for people to see. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting bringing that up, I guess because we're in this product management space. Um, just because I'm thinking back to like the product managers who I've worked with on projects that I've really enjoyed working with and like felt like I got a lot out of the projects and then they got a lot of the projects and then the PMs that I've worked with that it hasn't quite been that way. Because I think that the level of value that as a PM you'll get out of a research project, and this is like everything in life maybe, is directly equal to how much you put into it. 
and also just like the relationship that you develop with your researcher, right? So like PMs are so busy, like notoriously busy. I think we all know that. And obviously, as you saw on that slide, we have very specialized functions. And so it goes without saying that like the researcher is going to own the research, but I have worked with PMs who clearly want the research and have a really clear idea of what they're hoping to get out of it, and they get it out of it. And then I have PMs who are kind of like, oh yeah, we do UER, right? Like that's part of this process. And they never really get anything out of it, and it ends up being a waste of all of our time. And so I think just in terms of like, as a PM, if you, um, yeah, the best way I would say to engage research is to actually engage it, right? And to really deeply think about what you want to get out of it. I think Julia is an amazing example. She'll come to me and like somehow have read some project that I did like two quarters ago and like is using it, right? So like she's getting a ton of value out of it, where as there are other, you know, PMs who I think sometimes like just don't engage with it in the same way and it can it can just make it a little bit less fruitful, I would say, for everyone. Okay, so this is my favorite quote about UX research. This is my friend Matt who works at Airbnb. Um, and the reason that I love this quote so much is because I think sometimes people come to research functions, whether it's research or data science or market research or whatever, and they have this idea, I mean, even in the title, right, we talked about like validating. Validating is a binary act, like you're validating something or you're invalidating something, right? There's no like middle ground. And the reality is that we're building products for human beings and human beings are like all middle ground, like we're very gray area. Um, and so instead of thinking about research, especially when you're thinking of, you know, you're doing design research, instead of thinking about it as like a binary yes, no, right, wrong, I'm going to figure out like this is the 100% product to build, I think it's really productive to think about UX research as a way to reduce uncertainty, right? So we have all these different functions, data science, market research, UX research, all of these things that can help us get a little bit closer. But also if you think about like your favorite products, most of them are not the first version of that thing. Like most of those teams built something and then they pivoted, right? They built something and then they changed it. They built something and then they realized it sucked and everyone hated it or like whatever it is. And research is really a way to just get a little bit closer to that mark as opposed to exactly right on that mark. And I think the better we are at asking the right questions, the closer we'll get to that mark. But the reality is that like iteration is just an inherent part of the product development process that we're not going to get rid of, right, until we're like perfect, which, yeah, I don't think we're going to get rid of. So anyway, I love this quote because I just think it really helps set the right expectations when you're doing research um, and helps the team think about it too. I had, um, I listened to this talk, at, I was speaking at a conference and there was another woman who was speaking there from Headspace and she talked about this product development process that they went through and they did everything right. It was like the most perfect case study that I had ever heard for like redesigning the onboarding experience of Headspace. And she, you know, she went through, they talked to data science and they went through the serious research process and they like took things to user, like they just did everything right. It was like so beautiful. I loved everything about the case study. And at the end she was like, but we still didn't know like exactly what to do. Like there was still this gray area of like us having to like choose a path and go for it and just like iterate from there. And I just think that's so important when you're talking about validating product ideas. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So um, we're going to turn it over to, actually, we're going to do a little bit of like a moderated panel between <laughs> us. Um, so we wanted to just cover a little bit more about our process um, as we talk about like, as we think about validating ideas, how we get started at LinkedIn, how we make decisions and measuring success. Um, I think we'll have about like 15 minutes because we, so, so yeah. So, um, okay. So first off, the, in terms of like getting started. So, um, Julia, I'm just curious, like, when you work as a PM, how do you come up with an idea that you want to validate? So, great question. So, basically, when, as a PM, there's, generally, you have a strategy. So, at LinkedIn, we typically make three-year strategy docs, and that centers on a need. So, we have a user group. So, for pages, we're starting to gather. It's an admin, uh, for my case. So, we have these page admins. We have a three-year strategy of what are their core needs, what is LinkedIn uniquely positioned to solve those needs. So we've got a core problem statement, and from there, you're going to brainstorm ideas. So part of it might be a collaborative brainstorm where per idea, per need, you'll come up with a list of ideas. That's one source. The next one might be data. So from data, what are we gathering? From support tickets, what are our users asking for? And then from market research, what is the market need? 
that maybe they're not asking for, but is an opportunity in the market. So we would use those four different sources to get an idea. And then some ideas are really straightforward, like we should have an onboarding flow. Yes, like that's pretty clear. And so that might be an idea where you might involve research at a different stage versus we need roles and permissions. What roles do we need? What does that look like? like that might be an opportunity for foundational. We, we don't really know anything. And so that would be an idea that you get really early uh, and get research involved. So I'd say first you get the idea, then you figure out what do we need to do to figure out at least the scope to get started. Cool. Yeah, so all right, I'm actually kind of curious. So when Julie and I come to you, with an idea that we want to validate, like what's that process like for you when you're thinking about how you need to go about the validation process? So the first thing is that there are so many people coming to you with research requests that you have to be kind of like brutal in prioritizing them um, and figuring out like what are the things that the team actually needs to be most successful. And you know, I think a lot of times product teams can get really focused on like what they need to achieve in a specific quarter as opposed to thinking about like strategically what do they need over the next year or like what do they need to set them up for success over the next year. Um, so I think one thing is just like brutally prioritizing stuff and where you can referencing like older stuff. Um, I think if there is a project or a need um, that comes up that seems like it is a good candidate for taking on in a specific quarter the first thing that I want to know is like what are your very specific goals or questions that you're hoping to have answered coming out of it um, because sometimes people get excited about research and they just you know have a really broad idea um, and they haven't specifically thought about how they're going to use it or apply it um, and it's so important to think through that early on um, so yeah I mean I think part of it is just like figuring out what the prioritization is and then part of it is getting a really 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 clear idea together of like what you want to accomplish and what the timeline needs to look like and then obviously yeah, I think you're actually really good at asking why, because we actually had this conversation today. I like came up to Ariel. I was like, I need more research for these two projects, and she's like, well, why? Or like, you know, maybe can we think about it in a different way? Like, are there alternative ways that we can get out of this? Because she has like five other priorities on her thing. So, um, cool. So let me shift gears and talking about how we make decisions now once we gather data. So Ariel, I'm just curious because there's so many resources out there, and you gather so much data. So how do you share it out, especially with so many different teams at LinkedIn, and get their buy-in along the research process? Yeah, so this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, just because I feel like it's an area for improvement. So we have a wiki system um, that just works for UER, and by just works for UER, I mean like I swear we're the only people who like know how to use it or like find anything in it. Um, so in terms of sharing out, there is like a repository, but at a company like like LinkedIn, it's really difficult to just like help people be aware of all of the resources that exist because there are just like infinite exponential like pages and wikis and things that exist. So in terms of sharing out, I always, always try to make sure there's a record of it because like I said, you can end up getting so much off your plate by just having like a clear book of that project that you did before and like quotes and all of, um, you know, kind of the most valuable stuff from your earlier work. Then beyond that, when we do a project, we try to um, obviously include like the entire team that's working on it, any other teams that might be relevant for. I just got a request from one of our engineering managers. I like did this project and didn't think it would be relevant to him. And he was like, please invite me to all UX research share outs. And I was like, oh, awesome. So yeah, we try to invite like everyone that would want to come. And I think we could be better in just like sending out, like some UERs are really great about just inviting like everyone at the company, like, did you guys get that for Kevin? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, anyway, so we do a share out, right? And I think one thing that I'm learning lately or figuring out is how to not only do a share out, but also like translate it into action items like there, right? So how do you not only help someone like talk through user insights, but also help them to start applying those and like brainstorming what this might mean for their product area? Because the reality is when you throw a lot of information at people and you don't give them a chance to apply it, um, it can just go out, you know, in one ear, out the other. So, yeah, those are the ways we do it. Awesome. Um, so, Julia, I'm just curious. Now that you've like kind of, you know, you've heard Ariel's research, uh, and then you've also collected your research too. So, how do you start deciding like what features and audiences that you actually want to include when you're thinking about building the product? Yeah, so I think that boils down to the question Ariel hopefully would have asked me at the beginning of the research, like what are you trying to get out of this? 
And the crisper that problem statement is, the easier that this part becomes. Um, and so the idea is like, what features do we need to validate this problem? So if you know what problem you're trying to solve, you can break down what are the one, two, three flows or screens that are crucial. And I say that that's where having a really strong design counterpart and a really great relationship with them can help you prioritize. This animation might be nice, but this tooltip is crucial because it teaches someone what to do and when to use it. Um, or this screen is essential, but this one you could probably skip for the first iteration of it. Um, and so I'd say that just paring down what is the minimum viable product, I say it comes from two lenses. One is the lens of what is the question we're trying to solve and what am I trying to validate my idea of? And then second, what does design think is essential to making this flow make sense to users? And pairing that, I'd say the in between of these two lines would be the, use, the research insights that came out. So what did users say were they most excited about? Or what was the key goal that they were trying to solve that came out in the studies? So that's, we would then call that an MVP, so minimum viable product. And from there we define some fast follows. So we have this core set, after we've launched that we might have fast follows, but we'll learn and iterate. And then audiences at LinkedIn, we launch everything in an A-B test. Uh, so we'll, we will never ramp something to 100% of people tomorrow. Um, and they'd say we do it in two ways. So if you're working on a consumer product, you might ramp 1% of a global audience or 1% of a country's audience, depending on localization. If you're working on an enterprise use case, you might want to make sure it works for a few key customers before you go to everyone. So you might ramp in an alpha space where you might handle the users. And it may not work fully, but you'll have a dedicated sales rep that will walk them through and be there for the kinks that might not be fully there, but enough to start learning. And then after that true handholding phase, you might go into a beta that might have three, five X, the number of users. And after the beta, then you go into a GA, which is a general release. And from there, you start A-B testing. Um, so we follow one of those two ways to decide how to ramp and who to include in the ramp. Yeah, awesome. I want to add on about the features part too. So um, when Julie and I work together, we it's actually a healthy tension between design and product. So we don't wait for product just to tell us what to do in terms of design because there's so much data, it can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. So Julia might write something in the spec and then me as a designer or as a design manager is like, Actually, I don't agree that that's how we should be using that data to implement the, the, the design. Um, or even sometimes, like, you, you might actually, as a designer, might work with a product manager who likes to tell you what to do in the design. And I think it's really important to be that strong voice of the user because sometimes Ariel might not be involved in that process at that moment to help reminding. So and my job as a designer is to remember the voice of the user that Ariel is telling me and constantly trying to remind product and push for the right experience as well. So, cool. Um, all right, so let's move on to the last category, which is like more measuring success. So, um, Julia, when you think about when a product is launched, like how do you actually measure that success? Yeah, so the measurement, I'd say, comes in two ways. So the first way is before you even launch anything, the rule of thumb that I got, and my manager's really good about this, it is like if you don't know what metric you're trying to hit and what your expectations are, before you launch it, you shouldn't launch it. And you frankly just wasted your design and engineering team's time if you couldn't answer that question to me a month ago. And so I think that that is a really good grounding principle. So for any ramp you do, you would already have in mind, I'm trying to move this metric by this much. And it doesn't matter if you're wrong. The goal is not to be perfect every time, but the goal is to have a stake in the ground. Then once you've actually ramped it, you're going to start learning. So we have A-B testing tools. So we'll have a UX that you can go into and see users who have this experience versus users that don't, what is the impact, what differences are they using, are they seeing, and you'll start to see a readout there. And if I said that this is going to move this metric 10%, and I get in there and see that at 5% ramp, we're seeing a 2% lift, that's great. Like We might celebrate 2%, like that's nice, but the question I would start asking is why is it 2%, not 10%? Was 10%, I was grossly wrong in my estimate, or was there some assumption, for example, adoption? I guess that 90% of users would adopt this, and it's actually 10%. So that's when you start working with DizOps or data science to really investigate and start iterating on why are you not hitting that goal um, of that key metric, that North Star metric, that helps you know, are you solving that problem for users, or are you not? Awesome. Yeah, so Ariel, so um, Julia just talked a lot about quantitative data. So as a researcher, once a product is launched, how do you collect qualitative data so that the teams can iterate on the designs? 
So one of the one of the easiest ways to do UX research is to have something that's already up and working, right? Like it's so much easier because one of the things that happens when you're doing UX research is that you're kind of trying to like create this fake world, right? You have this prototype of like there's a lot of like doors that go to nowhere. It's kind of like the Winchester mystery house. Um, so when you have a product that's already working, it is so much easier to actually understand like usability issues or um, compare it to a new concept because at LinkedIn, like we change things so fast. Like we'll build something one year and the next year we're like completely rethinking it, you know, completely redesigning it or whatever it is. So I would say that a lot of that qualitative feedback comes in the form of members telling us, like literally writing us, um, like we get so much through our product operations team that's very qualitative. Um, and obviously like on social media, like when we launch something, we actually hear from a ton of users. So there are those forms, and then there's actually the opportunity to kind of compare what we have that's live and real to the new thing that we're considering. So again, taking it into that formative stage um, and doing some content testing. Awesome. And then just the last question is just, um, Julia, for when we collect all that data now, how do we go through the different iterations? Like, you know, what maybe the MVP didn't go well or it went well, but how do we determine like what are the next steps in terms of iterations? Yeah, so I'd say from iterations, there's a quant and qual perspective. So you might have said, like, we nailed it, and this is working super well, and we're seeing that ways to deepen this experience, we'd already identified those fast follows, and that's usually an easier case. You're like, okay, we already talked about it, it's working well, let's add filters, let's add search, let's add animations, those are great. And we know we're on the money, and so we'll, like, let's keep building. Um, and so that's when things are going well. A lot of times, though, it's not the happy path. And so you're seeing Twitter complaints, you're seeing people writing in that they're, this isn't working for them, um, and you're seeing metrics maybe not even go up at all, they're actually going down. Um, and so then that's when you start to get really curious. Um, so ideally you would partner with design and research and get to know our users and figure out why is this working? What assumptions did we make that aren't working? Sometimes that's possible, sometimes we're under-resourced and that's not possible. And you might actually just email or message this person directly on LinkedIn or even call them and say, hey, we launched this, I'm curious, do you have 30 minutes to talk to me? I'll give you a little gift card. I'm curious what's working, what's not. Um, and so that's a really tactical way that I use to figure out how can we iterate and move somewhere that isn't working. Um, and we might do that, or we might do intercepts, like Ariel mentioned, where we go down with a researcher, with a design partner, go down into like the lobby of our building or a coffee shop, show the product and see, maybe there's something we're not seeing here that users are trying to do and it's just not working and that'll help us pivot one way or another. I'm not the lobby of our building is a coffee shop. Two birds with one stone. Yeah, we sometimes do research there, so an offer of gift cards. <laughs> <laughs>